while he's chopping something down. The pressure's on Minnesota to get the thing back. It's been at Wisconsin for 14 consecutive years, and so the most important guy is Bryce Turnus. He's the guy carrying the thing inside Camp Randall Stadium, the manager for the Wisconsin Badgers. Be careful with it. It's one of the most important rivalries in the Big Ten and one of the oldest. First meeting, 1890, the 128th time they've gotten together, and it's been since 2003 that the Gophers have won one of these things. Jason Benetti, Kelly Staub, for Olivia Decker along with you. So, look, what does Minnesota have for the Badgers today? A chance? I do think a chance, but it's really interesting to me. Rivalry games come from the heart, and you have to kind of experience it. Well, most of Minnesota's side of the ball haven't experienced it. They're an incredibly young team, the youngest team in the FBS level. Wisconsin, on the other hand, they're war horses. They have a lot of guys. They have a bunch of seniors that are 41 and 11 with Paul Chris, and they know how to win this game, and they don't want to be the team team that gives up the ax, and they're going to hitch the wagon to Jonathan Taylor early and often. Jonathan Taylor, to me, is an elite back for this reason. His vision, speed, and finesse, and patience, and oh, by the way, every game plan is set to stop this young man, but he's still in Incredibly productive in the face of all of that. Pretty amazing. Look at the names that he has passed for the most combined rush yards for the first two years. Ron Dane from here in Madison, Herschel Walker, University of Georgia. So that's what Minnesota has to stop today, one of the best backs in the country. And what's at stake for the Gophers is a lot. Can you get those extra bowl practices, get P.J. Fleck into a bowl in his second season? The Axe has been on the Wisconsin sideline for 13 consecutive, 14 consecutive years. And can you win in Madison for the first time since 1994? Can you tie the series, which has come back into Wisconsin's column? Nobody better to encapsulate the series than our own Tom Rinaldi. The longest running rivalry in major college football is Minnesota and Wisconsin. Not to hoist the trophy, but to swing the axe. The handle has the score of every game the Gophers and Badgers have played. For the win. In 03, with a last second field goal. Paul Bunyan's axe goes to Minnesota. In 05, oh, he fumbled it. with a last minute block punt. It's blocked! Now, will the Gophers have a score to settle? Can the Badgers keep hold of Paul Bunyan's pride? Chop that. A school record 53rd straight start for Michael Dieter on the offensive line. One of the 16 seniors for the Wisconsin Badgers, Paul Christ's first senior class. They, like him, are 41 and 11 here in Madison. So the Badgers ready to jump around for one last time at Camp Randall Stadium on a chilly late November afternoon. Meantime, P.J. Fleck always well-dressed, always elite, as he says, and always rowing the boat, trying to steer that ship to a win in this series. After 14 consecutive losses for the Gophers, it dates back to a 2003 date in the Metrodome. Jim Sorgi and Assad Abdul Khalik were the quarterbacks. Last time, Minnesota beat Wisconsin for Paul Bunyan's axe. One last go around at Camp Randall for the Badgers, and the wind makes its presence felt. It is such a difficult game, and even sometimes the simplest of motions can be strenuous on a windy, chilly November afternoon. For the axe and the border, Wisconsin and Minnesota underway. Demetrius Douglas, the freshman, back to receive. Quarterback questions for both teams. Who's going to signal call for Minnesota? Olivia Decker. Well, Minnesota had a pick between two freshman quarterbacks today, and Tanner Morgan will get the start. He started the last four, and Zach Anikstead is available. He started the first seven true freshmen. Coach Fleck just told me he would love to stick with one quarterback today, and there are no special packages or situations for either quarterback. The reason they went with Tanner Morgan is because Coach Fleck thinks he can hold up better in this game. He's more gutsy, more mobile, and even more mobile out of the pocket. Well, we'll see 
whether or not both do end up playing. But as Olivia just said, they're both available. And it's been that way throughout this season. The Gophers have wanted one quarterback and haven't been able to land on one. First throw is a completion for a big hit for the Gophers to Tyler Johnson, their leading receiver. His 71st catch of the year, it's a gain of 23. And Tanner Morgan, Olivia alluded to this, a lot of the pass game is outside the pocket. It's boots and nakeds and things that they get the quarterback on the run. And Wisconsin defensively is going to try to light up whoever Minnesota has at that quarterback position. Notably, the Gophers all wearing Minnesota on the backs of their jerseys. They're not all named for their school. Just short of midfield, first down. Morgan too high and incomplete. Johnson was open and he airmailed it. I'm, a sh I'm sure with Tanner Morgan, there's a lot of juice flowing early in this one, and it's important to get settled down. I would expect some throws to allow Tanner Morgan to do just that. That one was just a little bit too high, went to the right place, just threw the wrong kind of football. It was either Tanner Morgan or Zach Anikstead. Both with very little time under their belts, just one season combined of FBS football. See how much pressure Jim Leonard brings as that ball is incomplete. Third down, and Henningsen with the tip on that ball. Anikstead is the other quarterback, the freshman out of the state of Minnesota. He is on the sideline for now, but we may see him as Olivia reported. Enix did is a great story. He's a walk on turned down some power five offers to walk on at Minnesota and his family certainly has a legacy there, but an early important down for Tanner Morgan his counterpart Bottom half of the FBS on third down for Minnesota Morgan incomplete Ibrahim, the intended target, the back, and after a, a positive first play, it bogged down. Yeah, and two tip passes on second and third down collectively, and that's what Wisconsin will do, JB, on defensive side, is they're going to show pressure and sometimes bail out, and they were on that play, but they affected the decision maker nonetheless. Herber is to punt. Jack Dunn to receive, but he's not going to get a chance to do much with this. A short kick. And Wisconsin has the ball. So now, who's going to play quarterback for them, Olivia? Well, Alex Hornibrook will start this one after missing most of the last four going through concussion protocol. He was just starting to practice middle of the week. Coaches wanted to see how he would handle that and then just recently decided he could play today. His backup, Jack Cohn, who started the last three, he is cleared to play, and Coach Chris said, whoever gives us the best chance to win is who will play. Now, if he plays today at all, he'll burn his redshirt option. That'll be his fourth, or his fifth game, excuse me. And Coach Chris told me they're not even thinking about that. Yeah, that's a side plot, certainly, they might think about later. But you see the win percentage. Hornibrook, the best in Wisconsin history so far. And part of that is because of this guy, Jonathan Taylor, right up the seam for a first down run. It took Huff the safety to knock him down after 12. And that is certainly what you're going to see. It's the calling card for Wisconsin football. It's kind of a program-wide calling card. And Jonathan Taylor is the latest in the group of great backs that have gone through this place and played a lot of downs here at Camp Randall. But it's a physical line of scrimmage to set the tone early. They're without their regular right tackle, Edwards. Logan Bruss is in for him as Taylor sets up a second down. Here's how Hornibrook got injured. November 3rd, he ends up hitting his head on the turf on this play here at Camp Randall, which put him out for a couple of weeks, got coming into the game, and now ready to go today, Alex Hornibrook. Yeah, and then from that point forward, it's the concussion protocol, and it's it's a medical decision. But there were good signs early in this week because Alex got to practice extensively and practice well. Taylor spun around and dropped. Carter Coughlin, the defensive end, got the first hit. Guy with nine sacks for this team, the junior out of Eden Prairie. And as always the case when you play Wisconsin, you have to load the box defensively to stop 
that power run game, massive offensive line, a very good to elite running back in Jonathan Taylor. And so it's up to Alex Hornibrook to make plays in the pass game. And here we go, probably the first time the ball's gonna be the, in the air in third and seven. Taylor out of the game, Garrett Groshek in as the third down back. Hornibrook goes down the middle and has a completion. Just across midfield to Danny Davis, the sophomore to first down Wisconsin. And Danny Davis is an important piece of the puzzle. He's been gaining steam as the season went along. We were in here in week one and Danny Davis was suspended and there were question marks galore over who was going to be those perimeter pass catchers for this team in that play action passing game. And Danny Davis, five catches and a couple of TDs in that triple overtime win a week ago. Danny Davis needs to show up big in this game. That was a furious comeback against Purdue to get Wisconsin win number seven. And Jack Cohn was at the controls for that. The sophomore out of Sayville, New York, a lacrosse powerhouse. And he was a very good lacrosse player as he was growing up. But Cohn, as Olivia said, if he plays in one more game, you blast that red shirt. Yeah, that's the new rule. And he's kind of mop-up duty actually in the game where Hornibrook got the concussion. Cone played in that one, started the next three, and so you're absolutely right. The, right, the next down that he would, or snap he would take, Cone would burn that red shirt, and I would think they would prefer not to do that. Draw, Taylor, Minnesota was on its heels, and a first down Wisconsin inside the 35, and you could expect that Jonathan Taylor would be one of our impact players. Yeah, I would say the impact's gonna be about 30 to 35 carries, and Davis is the other guy. Not one of your <laughs> yeah, no, no question. That was a pretty good call to put him in there. But then it's Cashman, Blake Cashman, the linebacker, who is a pleasure to watch play the game. He's a great tackler because of his closing speed. He rarely misses a tackle. It's going to be a good matchup today for this Wisconsin offensive line. Jonathan Taylor just hit 1,900 yards and went over it. Jonathan Taylor, consecutive seasons FBS history, he is on the way to some big time names. Marcus Allen, Ricky Williams, LaDainian Tomlinson, all of those guys are still available as possible chase downs for Taylor this year with a bowl game loop. Yeah, and he's probably gonna reel some of those in. And it's in the face of every game plan defensively to stop number 23, but his production is still climbing the record books. He's out of the game now. Taiwan Deal, who's back healthy, is back in. And he's snowed under by Kamal Martin, the linebacker, and his cavalry. Third down coming up. I mean, this rivalry has been all Wisconsin the last decade and a half. And you said it, Minnesota is so young over on that sideline, they don't even have a protocol for who would go and grab the ax from the Wisconsin sideline as is customary in this game. Yeah, and trust me, they'll figure that out if indeed they get to go put their hands on the ax for the first time in 15 games. We'll see how this one plays out. Hornybrook on third down. Fires for a first down inside the 20-yard line. Jake Ferguson, the tight end, with his 30th grab, 24 have gone for a first down. And this one does as well. Jake Ferguson is the tight end that's a really good route runner and a better blocker than actually Wisconsin thought that he would be. And that's exactly where Jake Ferguson needs to make a living today. You're gonna see a lot of one high safety out of Minnesota, man-to-man -man underneath, a lot of grass in the middle of that field for tight ends to run routes. Deal back in. And he breaks one tackle to turn the legs. You know, Ferguson is from a very important family in terms of athletic prowess. His Don't father, Brad, a football player in Nebraska. His brother, Joe, a safety here at Wisconsin. That sounds like a very important name around here. Some highly thought of family members <laughs> for Jake Ferguson. Are you leaving anything out of that story? Is there more to come, or are we good with that one? I, I actually think Wisconsin fans by now know that Barry Alvarez is his grandfather, but they can correct you if they want to on Twitter. <laughs> Deal gets a carry. And he was going sideways. So 
Third down coming up for Wisconsin, third and short inside the red zone. And if you can run the football effectively, as obviously Wisconsin can, they score 70% of the time touchdowns here in the red zone because they typically are in favorable down and distances, but this is where Hornerbrook also needs to be a impeccable decision maker, and I think that's the biggest improvement in his game, even though it was derailed to some extent because of the games he missed because of that concussion. Hornerbrook has to be able to make good decisions right here. They go empty with Groshik split out wide on third down. To the end zone, incomplete. Danny Davis latched on to by Coney Durr. And it's field goal time for Wisconsin. And Davis was in the slot and actually runs the fade route from the inside slot position. Durr actually had very good coverage. Obviously, Paul Chris did not believe so. He thought that was pass interference. Mm. And the ball was just actually thrown out of bounds. I have a pet peeve with not giving your wide receiver an opportunity to catch the football on a fade route in the end zone, and that was a good example of it. Rafael Gaglianoni from 31 for the first points of this Paul Bunyan's Axe game, and it's no good. Gaglianoni misses wide. Rafael Gaglianoni knew right away that he pushes this. Highly unusual. You can't keep the axe if you do stuff like this. You say you ready. A big one elsewhere in the Big Ten. No score here off the missed field goal. Zach Anikstead on to play quarterback for the first time for Minnesota. Now, Seth Green was there to take that snap. So, second down coming up. Now, Morgan comes on. That was Green taking the snap. So, Tanner Morgan back on to play quarterback. Seth Green out of the Wildcat formation. And second down for the Gophers. Morgan down the middle. He's gotten a couple of those quick slants. This one to Ottman Bell, Chris Ottman Bell, the freshman on a gain of 16. And Ottman Bell is really the third of one of those wide receivers. Tyler Johnson is the alpha in that receiving core from Minnesota and one of the best receivers in this conference. And then Rashad Bateman, the true freshman, is that electric guy that they move around and they build touches for number 13 as well. Morgan, tip ball again. Third time he's had one tip. This is Van Ginkle, the linebacker. JB Van Ginkle is the outside linebacker. It's typically a 30 front, meaning three down linemen, but they add does Wisconsin an outside linebacker to that rush. And Van Ginkle is one of those guys that can get after the passer, but if you're not going to get home, Get your hands up, and that's the third tipped pass against Tanner Morgan here today. How can Morgan work on that? What can he do? There's not a whole lot you can do because he flashes late. Sometimes you can steer around that guy, but when he's on the line of scrimmage and is just playing the football, it's very, very difficult. Ibrahim broke a tackle and finds his way to the 50-yard line. First down, Minnesota, T.J. Edwards, another one of their senior linebackers. For Wisconsin with the stop, they're going to lose so much in that second oh, level man. after the bowl game. You talk about experience, and that's really been the stabilizing factor for Wisconsin defensively. They've been banged up in front of that linebacking group and also on the back end of this in that secondary, but that group of linebackers is really second to none in this country in terms of experience and production. Morgan. Weak side pressure, and he got it off just in time for Tyler Johnson on a first down. He's one of our impact players. Kel, you picked very well today. Thank you. Tyler Johnson is the volume catcher for this offense. And Ibrahim, the question is, where would Minnesota's running game be without that young man? And it's the two safeties on the back end, Scott Nelson and Dakota Dixon. Nelson has been banged up, had a great week of work from his hammy that is feeling much better, and Dixon is just that impactful leader on the back end and really program wide for Wisconsin. 
They're going to lose a lot in that safety meeting room when Dixon leaves. Scott Nelson actually said this week to free safety, he's going to try and soak up as much as possible before Dixon leaves. Another slant and another connection. Rashad Bateman, another freshman and a first down Minnesota. A lot of times, Wisconsin defensively will play quarters coverage on the back end. Sometimes they press the corners, sometimes they play off. But by and large, quarters coverage, when you hear that, once the defenders in the back end see the route combinations, it turns into man-to-man -man all the time. So right now, it's run-pass option offensively with Minnesota and finding lanes in that secondary against that man-to-man -man coverage off of quarters. This run goes nowhere. Bryce Williams, freshman out of Sarasota, hit by Zach Baugh, the linebacker. Second down. So all Morgan so far, other than the one Wildcat run for Green, and Minnesota moving the ball pretty well. And we will see Seth Green again. He's a 6'4", 240-pound Swiss Army knife in a sense. They tried to play him at tight end in the spring. They moved him to wide receiver. That's now he's listed at a running back, but play him where you want. Big piece of cutlery right <laughs> yeah, there. No that question. Is, doesn't fit in the regular drawer. Morgan, three for four, 45 yards of the drive. Ibrahim back in at tailback. Run it again. And he's inside the red zone. Edwards again on the stop. He and Connolly worked so well together at that linebacker spot. And the clock operator's not going to have to hit that stop button too much in this game, you no, wouldn't imagine. No, not at all. But who Minnesota wants to be offensively is they want to not look dissimilar to Wisconsin. They want to have a, a very physical presence in the run game in that tackle box. And they do it more out of the RPO in their passing game as opposed to outright play-action pass a la Minnesota offensive, or excuse me, Wisconsin offensive one. Third down screen pass will not get them to the marker. Ottman Bell hit by Connolly. Fourth down. You kicking here? I think you're kicking here first and foremost because I saw P.J. Flick send his <laughs> field goal team onto the field. So I saw the answer to the test. Thanks, Karnak. <laughs> Got the envelope on your forehead. It's but nice. I think points are precious, regardless if they're of the three variety. We've seen Gaglione miss a gimme early in this one. So I think Minnesota to jump out of lead would be good mentally for them. They've lost 14 of these in a row, by the way. Emmett Carpenter bidding for the first points, and he is true. They won it on a field goal 15 years ago. They Do you know what the U of M does for you? From farms to breweries and orchards to markets, discover how the University of Minnesota is cultivating a new crop of Minnesota businesses. Do you know what the U of M does for you? From hooves to hands and paws to possibilities, Discover how the University of Minnesota is making medical advances for all Minnesotans. You want good running backs? They got good running backs in this series. Last time Minnesota won, Lawrence Maroney and Marion Barber the third each ran for a buck 30 plus. And Marion Barber the third's little brother is playing today for the Gophers. Thomas Barber, a junior linebacker who's become one of the leaders on that defense playing it his third season for the Gophers so can another barber bring the axe back to the Twin Cities it's a three nothing lead so far and something of a ragged game for the Badgers in the first 12 minutes of change Aaron Crookshank back to receive Touchback. And away we go. We'll step aside. It feels like Big Ten football today. A pooch. Try to bring the ads back to Badger Town. More than half the guys on the Minnesota sideline were like five years old when this happened. Last time Minnesota won the axe. It was a field goal at the end that did in the Badgers. Sorgi to Owen Daniels, a touchdown to tie the game, but Gophers win. Reese Lloyd from 35 yards away. He storms over and grabs the axe. A kicker with an axe is a very dangerous thing. 
Gophers haven't won since then. And Reese Lloyd, there's a story in the Minneapolis Star Tribune earlier this week. The reporter called Reese Lloyd, and the first thing he said was, every year like clockwork, the phone rings. Somebody needs to get the Gophers a new star in this rivalry because Reese Lloyd's phone is ringing off the hook. Here's what's changed since 2003. LeBron James was a rookie. Eli Manning was at Ole Miss. A-Rod was an MVP for the Rangers. And Jim Leonard, the defensive yeah. coordinator, was a DB that year. Punt returner as well. Very good DB. He's fun to talk to. We enjoy Jim really Leonard's is. company. You, you learn things when you talk to Jim Leonard. A great defensive mind. Alex Hornibrook to throw it down the middle. He's got himself a first down to the 40 and A.J. Taylor, the junior out of Kansas City. A terrific catch by A.J. Taylor. This ball is high and behind Taylor, and he does a great job of snatching it. But that's the area that there's room to be had when you're running routes against the one high safety man-to-man -man underneath. You have to win at the slot position or an inline tight end and get to the middle of the field and get separation and Hornerbrook can find you. Question is, can they? Big lick by Barber, second down coming up, Olivia. Well, Wisconsin's O-line was so highly regarded going into the season and the interior has stayed the same all season. All of them have been healthy and no one's more important than left guard Michael Dieter. It's his 53rd career start today. Guys, that's more than any Wisconsin player ever. Well, he addressed the team about the rivalry and how important this is and he said, look, it's the law of averages. At some point you might lose it. We have to be more focused and play with more of an edge than we ever have. You've got to in a game like this. You've played in rivalry games, Cal. You know it amps everybody up. Horny Brook to throw. And he's got some of the yardage. Third down coming up. Yeah, as the saying goes, you can throw out the records. I don't necessarily believe that. You earn the record. But sometimes Minnesota would have liked to throw out the record. They would have liked to, but really the motivation for games like this and the game rivalry games I've played in are, are more intrinsic. You, you really learn a lot about the rivalry from the people that support the program, by and large. It's so important to them, and some of the supporters of the program have decades invested in games like this, and so it becomes meaningful to you as well, but you ultimately have to have the experience of playing in one. Horny Brook, hi, and what a climb of the ladder by Kendrick Pryor, the sophomore of the south suburbs of Chicago and Homewood Flossmore High School. First down. And Hornibrook have has left probably three passes high and slightly behind. This one, Pryor had to go climb the ladder, but made a great catch nonetheless. Badgers and Gophers together again. 14 straight for Wisconsin, but Minnesota's got the lead after 15. Welcome to ESPN College Football, presented by ExxonMobil as part of the Jiffy Lube Rivalry Series. A couple quarters shy of jump around in Madison, and the Badgers' offense has not done much jumping around at all. It's 3-0 Minnesota off an Emmett Carpenter field goal, and Hornibrook is wide. His completion percentage is down this year as compared to past years, but there have been some signs of improvement in small ways. Yeah, in small ways, I think his, by and large, I think he's reading things well. He's getting through his progressions more quickly. I just think right now we're seeing a little bit of rustiness. Game time. You can't, you can't simulate this stuff in practice. It, when guys are coming after you in a live way, quarterbacks don't get hit in practice. You get hit in games, and right now, Warnerbrook's just a little off. Back to Taylor. And third down coming up, Chris Cotter on the Iron Bowl. Alabama up on top first, Tua from seven yards out, design quarterback run. Got some great blocking on the edge, so the Tide trying to do what Michigan could not, avoid the upset in their rivalry game up 7-0. Michigan gave up more points oh than John Beeline's team has. That 62 hung on him. I mean, that's the most scored in the series versus Michigan. 115 meetings to the most points scored in that game. 
The door creaks open for some other teams, possibly into the college football playoff. Horny Brook finds door number one closed. He lost the ball. Question is, did one of his linemen get on top of it, or Groshik maybe? Looks like Logan brust the right tackle at the bottom of the pile. Otomewa, I believe, was the one that got pressure from Minnesota. You know Again, what? I think the lineman punched it away. I think Biotis, the right. center, actually poked his hand in. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And once again, not a lot of separation on that single high safety man free underneath. How would you have reacted if your center made you fumble while you were playing quarterback? Nice punt. That's how you would have reacted? You just sat there. I was observing that nice punt. College football playoff rankings brought to you by Capital One. Week four from the selection committee. Alabama, Clemson, Notre Dame, and then who? A bunch of, well, Michigan is no longer a one loss, and Washington State is no longer a one loss. That's going to be interesting to see how now the committee, who hasn't really liked Ohio State as of late, does one really good win. By far, I think, Ohio State's best game of the season. Does that bolt them ahead of those other one losses? That's going to be interesting. And certainly, Georgia and Alabama will take care of itself as the season goes along in that SEC championship game. A couple other open questions as well as Ibrahim gets hit by that freshman safety, Scott Nelson. Those open questions are later tonight. Can Clemson and Notre Dame stay unbeaten in a couple of tough games, rivalry games? Yeah, and I think they certainly have the upper hand. I, I think they're prohibited favorites in those two matchups. There's just something that tells me the Iron Bowl is going to be a little unique today. I don't know if Auburn can actually pull the upset, but strange things as we know have happened in that matchup. Seth Green playing quarterback again. He's the running back wide receiver quarterback hybrid. And the ball is on the turf. Minnesota will have a third down. It appeared to me that the running back, Ibrahim, was actually going to take that snap. Either that, it was an errant snap. It was almost to the running back as opposed to the Wildcat quarterback in Seth Green. That was off. Weiler hit himself in the leg with the snap after the other center punched out the ball from his own quarterback. Odd happenings. The ax must be up for grabs today. We're going to have to open the ax files. <laughs> Morgan, sideline, and this was not caught in time, incomplete. Bateman did haul it in. He did not have a foot in bounds when he did, so it's fourth down. Freshman on freshman, Wild Goose, the starting corner outside now for Wisconsin defensively, bump and run man-to-man -man on Bateman, and Bateman is certainly that X factor in a sense. He, he will a lot of times be in the slot to try to gain some separation inside. And you have Tyler Johnson that's typically relegated to being a perimeter receiver. Herbers backed all the way up. They've had punt blocks to win games in this series. As Dunn gets absolutely mauled, and a flag comes in. Blake Cashman doused him. But he was too early. Certainly going to be kick catch interference, but Cashman made a tremendous play. Remember the rule is shoulder to shoulder and arms linked in front of the return. The Personal return. foul. Kick catch interference with targeting oh. kicking team number 36. There will be a 15-yard penalty. The play's under further review. That's the senior leading tackler. Could be in his final game as a Time collegiate out. player. Cashman, did he lead with the crowd of the helmet? We'll find out after this. out at home probably like the rest of you but i've learned a lot about wood floors tonight we got batting cage challenge <laughs> as you can see the monopoly board is set up with a 
a lot of hotels. I'm gonna make the pancakes. Grace is gonna make the, the eggs. You two are going to love the cupcakes. He's gonna check on the homeschool crew and make sure everything's going okay here. Stay strong, parents. We're gonna get this done. All we can control is right now and try to maximize our days the best we can. I'm just so grateful for family, for friends, for loved ones, and the Big Ten. Be a coach, be a teammate, be a friend, be a teacher, be a family. We are a team. We are a team. We are a family. We got this. We got this. We can do this. We can do this. Welcome back to College Football, presented by ExxonMobil. Targeting confirmed against Blake Cashman, so his team needs to win to get him another game. He's disqualified for the rest of the game. Forcible contact to the head or neck area against a defenseless player, which is a kick returner. Yeah, and it's simply by category, by definition, the kick returner is defenseless, and you can't have forcible contact above the shoulders and the head and neck, and Cashman did just that. So again, if Minnesota wins this game, they will be bowl eligible. They will have a bowl to go to. If Minnesota loses, Blake Cashman has played his final down That's as a Golden Gopher. And, and it was correctly officiated on the field, but Blake Cashman is the bell cow defensively for Minnesota. Make no question about it. A leading tackler, 101 tackles coming into this game, and he's a former walk-on. He epitomizes what this game is about, and... That's one of the things about that targeting rule that is hard to swallow, and I know Minnesota fans are thinking that right now. A run a reverse. It's not going anywhere. ESPN app, now with ESPN Plus. You can stream college football all season long on ESPN Plus. So start your free trial today. You download the ESPN app or visiting ESPNplus.com. Full catalog, 30 for 30s, live boxing, NHL, and more. That's Julian Huff, who's come in number 20 in white. He's come in for the Golden Gophers to play linebacker in place of Cashman. His twin brother, Jacob, is a safety wearing number two. We've call, uh, called his number already today. So they get to play together one last time, or maybe more, depending on win or loss. Hornybrook slings it inside the 30. It's a first down for Wisconsin. Danny Davis again, the target, and again a 10. Great job by Alex Hornibrook, kind of manipulating the pocket. Had to buy a little bit of time. Eventually, Danny Davis got open against that man-to-man -man coverage on the back end that Minnesota lives and dies with. A little bit of separation, but it was become the left-hander. Hornibrook stepped up in the pocket and threw a strike to Danny Davis. Six out of eight, 57 yards for Hornibrook. Counteraction Taylor. Huff with the stop. Chris Cotter in the studio. Let's check in on the iron ball. We showed you Tua scoring. May the Schwartz be with you. Anthony Schwartz, nine yards on the jet sweep. 7-7 seven, seven right now, late first quarter. All even up. They fell for it, Cotter. It's the oldest trick in the book. And JB, that's always going to be the question when teams play Alabama is. It's not that you can you stop Tua or not in that offense, but can you score any points? Yeah. And Auburn is off to a decent start. Haven't seen many penalties in this game other than the targeting. This will be a timeout. Charge timeout. Minnesota, their Minnesota. first. We'll step aside. The low scoring timeout. in Madison so far for the Axe. 2002, Minnesota took a loss, then 03, they got a win. Since then, they haven't won after that. That is the Axe. It's six feet tall plus, and here are some facts of the Axe. One of the 15 rivalry trophies in the Big Ten. I love that they used to play for the slab of bacon, but somebody lost the slab of bacon. One of the students did, so they had to have a new trophy, was, and they got this cool axe. Was it literally, it was never literally a slab of bacon, though, right? I mean, not like something you could it was. fry it up in the pan? Well, you could, but it was a trophy, so you probably shouldn't because, you know, you need to be able to win it. Uh, but the slab of bacon, as a, a flag comes in, the slab of bacon had both M and W on it, depending on how you turned it upside down or right side up. Holding, offense, number 61, 10-yard penalty, second down. I know you've been asking to see the bacon to prove that it's there. Here's the bacon. 
That's the original trophy. You see if you turn it one way, then it's a W. Turn it the other way. I hurt, an M. I hurt you the first time, but that was never bacon. We've established that, right? Well, it's a, it's a slab of bacon. Because Minnesota plays for another piece of bacon in, against Iowa. Floyd of Rosedale. Floyd Rosedale, and that's literally, at one time, that was literally bacon. It was the prize pig, and they turned that into a trophy, too. I don't think they turned that into the pig into a trophy, but you get my point. I have spent 72 hours with Bill Walton. I didn't need that. Third down coming up for Wisconsin off the hit to Danny Davis. Throw it down, oh, big fella. What's your name again? Okay. I like <laughs> my bike. I like my bike. I like volcanoes. It's third down, Wisconsin. He's Kelly Stauffer. Olivia Decker's downstairs. I believe I'm Jason Benetti. And we thank you for joining us on this cool Midwestern day. Third down, Wisconsin. Hornybrook intercepted. Tony Durr. That was right into his hands. And he's across the 40-yard line to the celebration on the Gopher sideline, a 24-yard return. This is a classic example of a quarterback making up his mind before he actually reads the defense. That was the last place to go with the football, and I think Hornerbrook just made a decision early. And Durr got underneath it, but the safety, Jacob Huff, was coming over the top, and the receiver was also covered man-to-man -man in his hip pocket. There was a triangle around the guy that Hornerbrook decided to throw the football to, I think, before he actually took the snap. Rust again, you think? I think so. I think you... Sometimes you just get a little bit off when you haven't practiced extensively, and we're seeing a little bit of that out of Hornerbrook early in this one. Morgan giving ground off his back foot. Good news, this guy's wide open. Tyler Johnson had nobody near him. A first down, Gophers. 28 yards. Tyler Johnson makes a great adjustment. He starts to the middle of the field, feels man-to-man -man coverage on his backside and turns back outside, and his receiver understood the adjustment that Tyler Johnson was making. Don't run to be covered, run to get open, and Tyler Johnson showed it on that play. You can see the instincts of a former high school quarterback, Tyler Johnson, helping out his quarterback here in college. That's the longest play of this game at 28 yards. Morgan sees a crease to the 25. Sports Center tonight after Utah State, Fresno State on ESPN. Michael East, Kevin Connors. Reactions from the 115th meeting that Michigan would like to forget how the Iron Bowl was decided and it hasn't been yet. Heather Dennis breaks down the college football playoff scenarios and there are many. Sports Center after college football on ESPN tonight and anywhere on the ESPN app. Under seven to go in the first half and a three-nothing score. Ibrahim is hit behind the line. Van Ginkel, one of those three senior linebackers with the stop. He's been the pass rusher, but they're a nice run play. Yeah, and a lot of times you can blitz the run as well. I think that was a great job of understanding what Minnesota wanted to do on second and short Jim Leonard brought a blitz but it was really to stop the run that Wisconsin anticipated right there third down six Morgan the freshman Walls cave in he's on the roll Morgan is clipped before he can get to the marker. T.J. Edwards, they hit. Do you go for it? I think you do go for it right here. I think it's going to be fourth and probably a good one, maybe one and a half yards. And I like what I see out of Tanner Morgan currently, making really good decisions. And that was a one, that was one of them. On first down, it was a run pass option. And nothing was there in the throw, and he read it as really the third option. So I think Minnesota's going to roll the dice right here. Minnesota has not been very efficient on fourth down this year. They're going to let the play clock sink down along with the game clock, and they'll bury a timeout. 
That would be their second of this first half. So DJ Fleck will talk it over. We'll step aside, see what they do after this. This season, Taco Bell is celebrating student sections and passionate fans like the Wisconsin Badgers by awarding the best student section of the year. Go to ESPN.com slash Taco Bell to see if your team made this week's rankings and to see how your school can compete. Seth Green is the quarterback in the Wildcat formation. P.J. Fleck told us this week they're going to have to be aggressive every way they can think of to win this game. On fourth down, we'll see if they snap it. They do. Green for a first down Minnesota inside the 20. A little post-play interaction between these two bordering schools. Remember, Seth Green is 240 pounds, and so he's a really good athlete at that Wildcat position. And they, Minnesota has done that throughout the season. The motion by Jake Paulson, the tight end, coming from the outside back into the box is just to add another big body at 280 pounds. And then it's just a matter of moving mass up front and getting a yard and a half, and Minnesota was successful right there. Ibrahim hit after a very short game. Remember, Minnesota hasn't won this series since 2003. This is a freshman-laden team. More than half the guys on that sideline are freshmen, so they're going to have to learn on the fly how to win this game. And P.J. Fleck is in charge of teaching them how to win it, and he's new to this rivalry, but he's played in them and coached in other rivalries, but the way you lead them is you have to do stuff like that. You have to execute on fourth and one and a half and convert to try to get a touchdown as opposed to try another field goal. That's the way you get the ax back after losing it 14 straight times, even though this team on the field has had nothing to do with that. I bring him again, and he'll be a yard short. Third down and one coming up for Minnesota. In every Wisconsin win of those 14 straight, the Badgers have had a 100-yard rusher, so it's fitting that Minnesota is doing a significant amount of damage on this drive on the ground. Yeah, Minnesota wants to run it. That's their MO offensively as well. They want to be a physical run team, and conversely, when you play Jonathan Taylor, you have to start there. You have to stop him and hold up and everything else. Green again out of the Wildcat. Up the middle. And they're only going to give him the 10 on the initial spot. Now, the near side official is about half a yard further. Edwards the stop, and it's fourth down. If you're Minnesota, I think you have to like the way your offensive line is playing up front. There's not a ton of leakage from the blitz looks that Wisconsin likes to bring. That was an unfortunate spot, I think, for the Gophers there. Cal. I think P.J. Fleck is wanting this spot to be reviewed, and it might be right now as P.J. Fleck calls the timeout and is livid on the sideline. We'll take it with him, see if replay initiates a review. 2.49 to go first half. So the official announced that the spot was the nine yard line. They moved the ball. The ball is still slightly short of the dead center nine, and Minnesota is this much short of a first down. And they was. If I'm a Gopher fan, yeah. I'm livid right no, now. No question. And P.J. Fleck was. And I still think it's a bad spot. We thought there was a first down by Seth Green on that third down play by maybe as much as a half a yard. Would you call that spot where they put the ball the nine? No, I would say it's about five inches short of the nine. Ron Snodgrass, the referee, announced that the spot was the nine yard line. Wisconsin for now gets something of a break and P.J. Flex got to go for this, right? I think there's no question about it. The interesting thing is it seems like Tanner Morgan is in the huddle as opposed to Seth Green. Downstairs, Olivia. I have never seen a head coach walking up to the yard line and trying to beg the chain gang to try to move their chains with it. P.J. Flex so livid there, but then with a big smile on his face, going over begging for inches. Yeah, and it wasn't the chain gang's fault. No, it, it wasn't. was the 
the spot by the officials on the field and we're having another timeout to try to get this thing straightened out but that's a horrendous spot as it stands now if you're wondering why they had a timeout left it's because he used the timeout to get the review they ended up reviewing it he was right he gets the timeout back now he uses it you follow that i did they kick off your week 12 sunday nfl countdown before facing aaron Rodgers. sunday harrison smith goes one-on-one -on -one with darren woodson and and how a special message of hope and humility by Cam Newton inspired a family when they needed that message most. Sunday at about countdown, 10 a.m. on ESPN. Then Texans and Titans, 8.15 Eastern, 5.15 Pacific on ESPN. Simulcast on ESPN 2 in Spanish and available on the ESPN app so you can watch anywhere. Badger fans will be interested. J.J. Watt and the Texans. Coverage starts Monday night countdown at 6. Former Badger. J.J. Watt, 2010 AP second team All-American. What a player he was oh my. and is. Yeah, he's the type of defensive end that can just simply take over a game and has done it often, actually. The Watt family has had a major mark on this Badger program. So 225 officially on the clock in a run-heavy first half. Green will be the quarterback on fourth down and an inch. We're probably going to be seeing a repeat of third down. Ibrahim, touchdown! That's what they wanted you to think. Touchdown, Gophers. And it was the exact same presentation where the tight end Jake Paulson starts outside and motions inside. On the third down play, Seth Green just essentially ran a power play or a lead play off the right tackle. And this time it was a true quarterback read and he gives it up to Ibrahim untouched around the left side. Well executed by Minnesota. Nine play touchdown drive. The final eight plays of said drive were all runs. After an opening interception to set up the drive, Hornibrook and Wisconsin were driving. He yeah. threw it right to Durr, one pass, and then under the ground. Yeah, the pass was a 28 yarder, and that was the first play of this drive, and then it was a the aggressive tone that P.J. Fleck gave us on the phone, we're seeing it, and Ibrahim eventually takes that one around the left side, but the spotting minutia was overcome by P.J. Fleck's squad, and that's the aggressive play calling that Minnesota has to have today in order to get that ax back. Well, if P.J. Fleck had the axe in the sideline, he might have taken it to <laughs> yeah, the down would, marker. That's why it doesn't ago. come out to live in this game until the game is essentially decided, right? We're not going to see the axe until way late. When either Minnesota goes rushing to the sideline to claim it or Wisconsin circles around it and celebrates again. 546 on that drive as Minnesota grinds out the clock and Wisconsin will have one more possession in this quick-moving first half. They'll get it at the 25. Chris Cotter. All right, first update on the Iron Bowl. Tua has seen what Haskins has done. He's seen what Murray has done. He says, I want that Heisman Trophy. Finds Henry Ruggs the third for the score, 14-7 right now in the Iron Bowl. Halftime coming up in just a little bit. Emmanuel Lacho and Jim Moore will join me. More on that Iron Bowl, plus Ohio State and Michigan. What do you see what the Buckeyes did to the Wolverines? And a little post-game drama between the Gators and the Knowles. What else would you expect in that rivalry? It's all coming up on Rivalry Saturday. See you in a bit. Love Rivalry Saturday. One of the best days in college football. And Wisconsin and Minnesota are 10 zip so far. Taylor gets chopped down at the 31 by Jacob Huff, who socked him from the safety spot. And Wisconsin continues to count on the first down run, but Hornerbrook has to make great decisions and down in distances just like this. All three timeouts remaining for Wisconsin. They'll turn to Taylor. And a flag comes in late. Yeah, this is a big-time hold by A.J. Taylor out on the edge. 
grabbed a couple of handfuls of holding offense number four 10-yard penalty second down aj taylor was out on the edge as a wide receiver and what wisconsin wants to do in their run game the wide receivers have to block a ton and taylor was out on the point of attack and we've talked about this so often if you're out where the ball is coming you can't be holding especially late you have to let go you can get away with holding early in the play late in the play everybody in this stadium is looking your direction including the official that threw that flag onto the turf Barney Brook gets it away to Kendrick Pryor the 26 they looked like they were teammates in a dance competition that's how much of a hold that was and with third down coming up Wisconsin's got a guard against Minnesota having one more drive in the tank. Early snap, Horny Brook dropped, flat out dropped by A.J. Taylor. A rough drive for that junior wide receiver. Really well done in terms of ball placement by Alex Horny Brook. But watch A.J. Taylor at the very end. His head goes up, but my question is where would he think he was going? You should be going outside with that football anyway. His head went up as if he was going to turn back inside. That wouldn't have been the right decision at this time in the game where there's short time left, about a minute 20. He should have been following the ball and going out of bounds. Cal, that was a 59-second three and out. Douglas on the approach. Took a moment to let it settle. Demetrius Douglas for Minnesota. He has goal line on his mind. Touchdown, Gophers. Last time they scored in 546. This time it was about 10 seconds. Well, if Minnesota wants to get the axe back after 14 failed attempts, you have to do stuff like this. Demetrius Douglas does a great job of the punt returner has to make the first wave miss, and then you have a chance in the open field. And Douglas did a masterful job, but in the axe game, you have to stop Jonathan Taylor, and you have to make things happen. Four down situations, Minnesota made it happen and got into the end zone with Ibrahim and, and then it's Douglas on a huge special teams play. Last time Minnesota crossed the finish line in first place in Madison, Daryl Bevel, the former Seahawks offensive coordinator, was the quarterback for Wisconsin. But 2-2 Atwell, the elder 2-2 Atwell, a 32-yard touchdown. Gophers got the win in Madison, 17 to 14, and the ax was on its way to the Twin Cities. Series history, 128th meeting, last 14 games to Wisconsin. The ax has been around since 1948. They have all of the games on the handle. And the fact that Wisconsin took the lead in this series for the first time after last year's win was the thing that jumped out to me. I mean, this has been an even series, but talk about recent history. You would think Wisconsin was the was the program that had that lead forever, and that hasn't been the case. Most of the people wearing gopher stuff that are of the younger persuasion have only seen maybe one or two gopher wins in their lifetime. Two touchdowns in 76 seconds have certainly helped the case here, Crookshank will take it out. And he loses about a yard on that decision. Most played rivalries in the FBS, Minnesota and Wisconsin, Cincinnati and Miami, Ohio, Auburn and Georgia, the Civil War, Cal Stanford, 119 times the band has stayed where it's supposed to, and then Army Navy, 118 times. What's yeah. your favorite? Army Navy I think the pageantry around that game and the ultimate respect the I would think that one's kind of hidden shoulders above the rest but there are a lot of classic rivalries throughout college football and you're right this is a great weekend they'll run it with Taylor and he zigzags for a first down 
Creighton's been their best offense so far, and it's not close. Now he's going to come off the field. Broshik the tailback, clock winding. Hornybrook down the middle. He's got Danny Davis. Ball on the deck. And Wisconsin did get back on it with Ferguson. This half needs to end for the Badgers. Yeah, and Wisconsin is going to call a timeout to try to extend it, but I think Danny Davis might have been down, even though Wisconsin jumped on it anyway. But if Wisconsin wanted to try to get something done on this drive, Jason, after the good first down run by Jonathan Taylor, you have to manage clock at that point in time, and they were substituting was Wisconsin and losing time off the clock, and that's just not the way to do it. Keep the same sub package on there and make hay with those guys. Let me double back to the last drive because Wisconsin, when there was more time on the clock, was speedier with its snap, giving extra time to Minnesota if the Gophers needed it, which they didn't eventually off the punt return for the touchdown. Yeah, I completely agree. A little befuddling in the ways that Typically, Wisconsin is buttoned up. Look at that. First time Wisconsin shut out in the first half at a home game since 2015. Remember what we have on the line here. It's not only the Axe, but the fact that Minnesota hasn't won the Axe since 2003. They haven't won at Camp Randall since 94. Minnesota shutting Wisconsin out for the most part without Blake Cashman, the linebacker, the senior, who's gone out after a targeting penalty. They're Coughlin with the stop and a first down. Coughlin was coming. Hornybrook gets it away and out of bounds to Davis once again. So they're roughly in field goal range. Gaglianoni so far has a long of 42 this year, but he does have a strong leg. And I like the way Hornerbrook has looked on this two-minute situation. Wisconsin has one timeout, actually two timeouts left. But sometimes it's interesting that the two-minute drill in football kind of lights a fire under an offense that's been somewhat lethargic today has Wisconsin. So maybe this will be it for them if they can get points and then go into that second half and they get the football back coming out of halftime. Very important point. They will see the football first. Down to the ground, a beautiful grab by the tight end, Ferguson. we got to bury a timeout. Yeah, yeah. I can see Wisconsin. Paul Friss running down the sideline to burn one of those two timeouts remaining, and Wisconsin will have one left. So with 17 seconds, theoretically, you can certainly do about anything you want. Throw the ball into the middle of the field. Tonight, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. It's over on ABC. Number three, Notre Dame goes for an undefeated season and 12 and 0 college football playoff berth is on the line. USC tries to stand in the way. Like everything else, you can watch it live on the ESPN app from anywhere. Home team has won the last five. Notre Dame says FBI about three quarters of the time if you play it out will win the game but uh it's a rivalry and things change things change so what you're saying is we have a chance if we're usc is that what we're talking about same goes for south carolina tonight against clemson yeah i don't uh, Less believe of a there's chance. yeah i don't think there's much of a chance in either one of those i really <laughs> like notre dame big and i like clemson big as well even though they're rivalry games and theoretically anything can happen 17 seconds, Hornybrook launches incomplete. That was into traffic, and Jacob Hunt flanging into Ferguson. Five seconds off the clock, 12 remaining. Second and 10 with 12 seconds left in a timeout in your pocket. You can do the same thing all over again. Throw the ball to the middle of the field if need be. The question I have for Wisconsin, we had it in week one when we were in here. Where are their plays on the perimeter? Their Why longest receivers are making plays outside. Their longest pass play this year is 44 yards all year long in 11 games. Groshek on the run. They'll use the timeout. Six seconds remaining. So the question is, do you run one more play or do you take the three and make it a two-score game? You can 
logistically run one more play with six seconds. It has to be quick into the end zone, probably a fade into the back corner. And Wisconsin certainly wants to talk it over, but that's possible, Jason, right here. I think anything under five seconds, and you may not want to try it. You get the ball, kind of think you take the points here. They I kind of two-score game. I kind of like a fade into the corner of the end zone. You catch it. You certainly don't want to give it to the other team, and Hornerbrook has done that before in this game. But this is pretty cut and dried. You have to get it up early, throw it to the back pylon. It'll take about three to four seconds. And if you don't get a touchdown, you line up and put Gaglianoni out there to try to get three. Maybe you pray a little bit, too. Six seconds. Barney Brook taking his time into the end zone. Touchdown, Wisconsin. Ferguson with one second. See, they had one whole second left. And I think Minnesota defensively thought that they were going to throw the fade quickly like I had talked about, and the nuns certainly like it, dressed up in Wisconsin guard. But the game they played with Jake Ferguson at the tight end, that was surprising, but nonetheless well executed with one whole second left. Divine acts intervention in the final seconds of half number yeah. one. Paul Christ has played in this series. He's been an assistant in this series. He scored one of his two touchdowns in this series against the Gophers. And his team in a buck four gets into the end zone. Paul Christ, tight end, quarterback, both at Wisconsin. Look at that old school face mask. I love that. That's good stuff right there. Yeah, I had one just like it. Hardcore Big Ten. Assistant coach 02 and then 05 to 11. One of the top assistants in the country. He takes over as the head coach at his alma mater. Madison through and through and he knows how important of, of anybody on these sidelines. Yeah. He knows how important this game is even though his two coordinators have played in this game multiple times yeah, as well. And this group of seniors are 41 and 11 exactly like the head coach they came in with and so the group of seniors are war horses and they don't want to be the badger team that gives this axe up for the first time in 14 consecutive tries so that touchdown right there was vital needless to say and we talked about it wisconsin will get the ball coming out at halftime that was huge right there So you would have, if you were play calling or decision making for Wisconsin, it would be 17 to 3 currently, and you would live with that, right? I would have kicked. I would have kicked. But if that, think about this, if that ball gets juggled in the end zone, popped in the air, yeah, right? You, you get it. nothing. Hey, you can't keep the axe if you're not willing to throw it out there once in a while like Wisconsin did. And we've already seen Minnesota do multiple times. On the ground, and that will do it for half number one. Minnesota and Wisconsin will continue to battle for the ax. Kelly and I will bury the hatchet and we'll go back to the studio for the half. We're one Minnesota. And when you're starting to see how this whole thing can really work in this whole Twin Cities area, that's what we're talking about. But our fans were unbelievable today. That's the best college football environment I've ever played in as a head football coach. So let me go deep to Bateman. He's up there. is can they hang on can they get an axe to go along with their oars two years ago here in madison same score wisconsin came back and won so the question is how do they stick to this lead and put it away do those people realize they actually didn't have an oar there was no I mean, oar in that picture well the oar means it's <laughs> optional that's why it's oar minnesota looked like the best team in the first half 
They're the youngest team in the country. They will know what they're playing for in the second half. We'll see if they can stick with it. It's going to take a complete game out of Minnesota. Hornibrook for Wisconsin has to be better in the second half. He was rusty in the first half. The balls were thrown off target. He made that one horrendous decision, and Minnesota capitalized on it. This is going to be an interesting, JB, interesting one down the stretch here. Wisconsin does get it first, and they'll have it at the 25. Take a look at our Pacific Life game summary, and it was special teams that really lit it up for Minnesota late in the half. Demetrius Douglas makes the huge play in special teams and makes guys miss early, and then it was just outrunning the punter, and most of us can do that, but Demetrius Douglas gets in the end zone, and P.J. Fleck told us that earlier in the week. It's going to take a complete game out of them. Offense, defense, special teams, and we saw that out of Minnesota in the first half. We saw offensively they were 0 for 5 on third down, but 2 for 2 on fourth down. And defensively, Jonathan Taylor just did not hurt Minnesota in that first half. Good news for Wisconsin, though, is that final drive when they did punch it in with a second to go in that first half. Hornybrook dancing, and he drops it off to Taylor, who doesn't catch the ball much. He did there. Olivia just caught up with Paul Chris. Well, Coach, you score on your final drive. What can you adjust on offense to be a little more efficient? Well, I mean, we've got to, obviously, we had the one turnover in the red zone. We didn't finish our first drive into the red zone. We just got to, got to go make plays, and we've got to, obviously, still have a good mix of run and pass. It's going to take everyone, and it's uh, another half of football. You told us that this rivalry is the most intense of your season. With that in mind, what did you tell your guys in the locker room? Well, I mean, right now, you, you got to go play the game, and you got to play each play, and obviously, we got to make some plays, and, and uh, you want to enjoy the opportunity to play and against a very good team, and, and uh, we got another half, half or more football. Thanks, Coach. Thanks. We heard it last week from the Harvard and Yale side when we were out there at Fenway Park. There is a tax when it comes to the emotions of a rivalry game. Yeah. Can Wisconsin control them better because they know it better and they've lived it? That's, that's a great point. Wisconsin certainly uh, a more veteran bunch across the board on both sides of the football. Taylor, footwork. What a gem he is. He is inside Minnesota territory. Barber took him down after a gain of 14. And Jason, where there's also attacks is Jonathan Taylor in the second half, and particularly in the fourth quarter. This massive offensive line for Wisconsin and the power run game, they will wear you out. And it may not look so in the first half, but they pay dividends in that second half many times. He's now past D'Angelo Williams and Charles White. Hornibrook, a dangerous throw, and he does get it to the sideline, and Taylor with a tightrope job. I think Hornibrook was past the line of scrimmage. It would have to be his whole body. Illegal forward pass. Offense, number 12, was beyond the line of scrimmage when he threw the pass. Lost five-yard penalty, lost it down. Second down. And you're right, Jason, it has to be the entire body of the quarterback, Alex Hornibrook, to be across the line of scrimmage. See, it's the 50. I, I'm not sure if any part, even the backside, and this is reviewable, even if it's his back foot and the heel of his back foot, got to be it, right. Got to be completely beyond the line of scrimmage, and it's essentially the 50-yard line right here. We'll find out what the officials say after the review after this. You're watching the Big Ten on ESPN. Call stands. Illegal forward pass, Kyle. What do you think? I think it comes down to the angle, unless we had a camera angle that was essentially exactly on the 50-yard line. I don't think the officials were going to see indisputable video evidence to overturn it. It has to be everything that belongs to Alex Hornibrook has to be over the yard line and I just don't know that the officials had a good look at the end of the day we're we're about right on the 50 and it didn't look egregious to me see I would I would say you have to look at the heel it looked to me on that replay like his heel was on the 50 yard line but I can see where you're coming from if the camera angle is not dead center 50 yard line you get a distorted picture in the replay booth so Groshek on the delay, ran into his line. 
Ben Shaw was the one that provided the resistance, the right guard, the senior. And Minnesota on that second down and loss of down. Remember, it's not just the penalty on the when Hornerbrook was beyond the line of scrimmage. It's also a loss of down. So on that particular play, it seems like it's going to be a pass down. Minnesota was a too high safety look to get past coverage, and Wisconsin tried to run into that look, which they should, but didn't execute well. Hornibrook, quicksand. And this is going to be fourth down and three. What you doing, Kelly Stauffer? Paul Crisp seems to be playing things right down the middle, but it appears right here. I would think typically he would punt and gain field position, but I think with the momentum that his team gained at the end of the first half with that late touchdown, he wants his offense to get something on this drive, and so therefore, Fourth and about four, it would appear that Wisconsin is going for it. Look for the hard count right now out of Alex Hornerbrook, a veteran third-year starter at that position. Jonathan Taylor not in the game. Hornibrook off his back foot, incomplete. He wanted Taylor, he missed him, and Minnesota takes over. And that was incredibly poor execution. Danny Davis was once again in his slot position. Actually, this time it was A.J. Taylor. Slot position, gonna run a fade outside and just woefully thrown and also poorly executed by the two receivers to that side. I, I know Jonathan Taylor's not the third down back. He plays yeah. mostly first and second down. Why would you not have him in the game to provide at least the thought in Minnesota's mind? At least a decoy. I completely agree. So Minnesota gets it back after a five minute, 46 second touchdown drive late in the first half. Tanner Morgan hands it off. Ibrahim on a first down run. Eight Eastern, five Pacific. It's over on ABC. Number three, Notre Dame aiming for an undefeated year and a berth in the college football playoff as USC stands in the way from the Coliseum. You can watch it live on the ESPN app, Ian Book. Nearly 73%. He is back, he is ready. And Notre Dame USC later on tonight. 8 Eastern, 7 Central on ABC. Another run, Ibrahim to the 47. He was supposed to be the third string running back. Injuries piled up and he's going to be nearly a thousand yard rusher and maybe above that if they do end up in a bowl game with a win today. Minnesota told us earlier in the year or earlier this week that they don't know where they would be without him. He kind of came out of nowhere like you're talking about and they want to establish a physical run presence in the box and then it's the RPO game the run pass option off of that physical run and he's the center of that attention. He switches sides here. Minnesota goes with him, and he puts the shoulder down and barrels through the Badgers for a first down. Scott Nelson got a face full of him on an 18-yard ramble. Ibrahim is set to only be 205 pounds at 5'10", but he's a physical runner. You can see that on tape. He does a great job of finishing runs, typically it's not only yards after contact, but it's going forward at contact, and you saw it front and center on that play. Out of only Maryland, good counsel. Strong basketball program there. He comes to Minnesota. Straight ahead, and Nelson got him this time. That was some vengeance for the freshman out of Detroit, Scott Nelson. So, Jason, what Minnesota does offensively is they a lot of times play box numbers and they will formation accordingly. And then Tanner Morgan basically counts numbers in the box. Is it a favorable look? If so, we run it. If it's not, a lot of times off that run pass option, he'll pull it and throw behind that coverage. For people who don't know, in the box, meaning what? It's tackle to tackle, essentially, or tight end to tight end. How many hats are in the box to defend the run, and do we have leverage or do we not? So seven here, as Morgan goes sideline, a lot of contact, and a flag comes down. Johnson got wrangled by Rashad Wild Goose. 
And it's going to be first down Minnesota. But Tyler Johnson is a dynamic receiver at 6'2", and he was going up to get this football, and Wild Goose was holding on to him, and Johnson couldn't even get off the carpet. Pass interference, defense, number five, 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. And I really like this matchup if I'm Minnesota. Tyler Johnson, one of the best perimeter receivers in the Big Ten against Wild Goose, who's a freshman. The Jim Leonard, the defensive coordinator for Minnesota, or excuse me, Wisconsin, really likes and thought that Wild Goose may become the starter as the season went along, but Wild Goose was in great shape and then panicked late in that coverage. So you're saying that Jim Leonard hoped that he would chase down that position? Yeah, and Wild I think, Goose. yeah. <laughs> I'm not Bill Walton. Don't go there with me. Now it's going to be the Wild Cat for the Gophers. They've got Green in, along with Ibrahim. <laughs> Whistle before the snap and a flag. False start. Offense, number 78, five yard penalty. First down. Minnesota top five in the nation in penalties per game, just over four per game, and the rare shot into their foot there. Daniel Fa'alele is the right tackle, the true freshman at 6'9", about 400 bills. And if you twitch anything on a 6'9", 400-pound body, someone in the <laughs> stadium is going to see it. They and may that's feel exactly it. What they could feel it. Yeah, it may be a seismic Please event. Please reset the game clock to 9 minutes, 14 seconds. 9-1-4, thank you. We He's just lost a second from our lives, by the way. <laughs> we'll never get it back. Paul Lely has to be like the biggest human being in college football, right? One of them. That's for sure. Call Sig and see if we can get some numbers on that. He is the Zion Williamson of college football. Green inside the 10. Isaiah Loudermilk with the stop. He had offseason knee surgery in June, missed the beginning of the year, and now has stepped in for a defensive line that's been beleaguered by injuries with Olive Sangapolu out for the year. Yeah, that's huge. With Sangapolu out, who typically is the nose tackle and is supposed to occupy a center and a guard typically, and Loudermilk is the one defender on the defensive line of scrimmage that makes Wisconsin different, but that difference has been lessened greatly because of the injury to Loudermouth throughout this year. Minnesota hasn't beaten Wisconsin since 2003. Morgan trying to help out and he misfires. Third down coming up. And Morgan just did not get his feet set. Colton Beebe was the tight end coming underneath that and leaking into the flat and wide open. If you put the ball on number 44, BB, he has a chance to get at that in the end zone. But Tanner Morgan got stuck a little bit on his ball handling to Ibrahim and just did not get his feet set on that throw. One for six on third down in a game they lead by 10. They've got Green split out wide, Johnson in the slot, and Morgan maybe changing the play. P.J. Fleck running to the 10-yard line to call a timeout. There's no foul for delay game. Charge timeout. Minnesota, their first. P.J. Fleck timeout. looked like Lawrence Maroney sprinting down the sideline to bang that timeout. Gophers have run through some quarterbacks. We've seen a lot of snaps that haven't beaten Wisconsin. Brian Cupido, Adam Weber, Mitch Leidner at all. And they've got a freshman at the signals today. The red shirt Tanner Morgan trying to beat Wisconsin for the first time in 15 seasons. And a key down here for the Gophers. Third down and nine. A lot of time left on the play clock. They run. Ibrahim breaks two tackles and finds his way to the five-yard line. What are you doing here? Are you kicking or are you being aggressive again? I think I'm kicking. Really? Yeah. Why so? I don't like the way my offensive line responded on that 
run right there. And I think over, over time, we've seen more runs because I think Minnesota has liked their offensive line, but that one wasn't a good outing. So I think we take the points to get something off of this drive. I think mentally that's the right decision here. Emmett Carpenter from 23. It's good. And Minnesota leads 20 to 7. You know, in the first quarter, Jason, Minnesota was more of a pass first team. And then since that time, it's it's been more run than pass. And I think it's for a few reasons. One is I think Minnesota liked the way their offensive line was playing, even though that last effort was not great. But also there have been opportunities for Seth Green to be in there, kind of that wildcat robo quarterback situation or whatever you want to call it so I think that's why we've seen more run selection offensively for Minnesota as of late and they believe in their defense a little bit more than a couple weeks ago as well tonight 8 Eastern 5 Pacific it's over on ABC number three Notre Dame against USC college football playoff berth on the line for the Fighting Irish gotta have it Dexter Williams and Notre Dame one of the top run games in the country gotta have it gotta have it Dexter Williams has gotten better since Ian Book has taken over as well. That pass threat in an offense is huge for the running game, and that has been the difference down the stretch for Notre Dame offensively. Brookshank from the five. No fair catch this time. He's got a seam. Outside to the 28, and the ball came loose down the sideline and Wisconsin gets on top of it Huff knocked it free flag in as well so we'll check the marker Wisconsin loses yardage on the fumble and maybe more off the marker during the return holding receiving team number 57 10 yard penalty first down Certainly very fortunate for Wisconsin right here. Wisconsin just isn't valuing the football, and that was pretty shoddy ball security there, and Wisconsin was fortunate to get on that one, or that would have been the second huge special teams play by Minnesota. Demetrius Douglas with the punt return in that first half, and that would have been gigantic right there. I feel like Wisconsin may not have been able to withstand yeah, I think you're happened. right. I think the right now there just isn't a lot of confidence offensively for Wisconsin, and they're not exactly a team that's built to have explosive plays and come back anyway. Except for this guy. Jonathan Taylor tripped up by the Camp Randall turf at the 32. It's a gain of 20. And when you're playing Wisconsin, you always have to keep on, an eye on the run game effect in the second half. Wisconsin is a power run team. Sometimes it doesn't look good in the first half, but it pays dividends in the second half, especially the fourth quarter. 103 yards for Taylor. Ball on the deck. They are going to say that he was down, I believe. The near side official pointed to the turf. And I think that line judge actually is the one that called this on the near sideline and I think he called it correctly I think the ground caused that fumble Jonathan Taylor had possession of it until he hit the turf that's Jacob Huff that's injured for Minnesota we'll step aside welcome back to ESPN college football presented by Exxon Mobil as part of the Jiffy Lube rivalry series Jonathan Taylor now over 1,900 yards for Wisconsin, wrapping on the door of 2,000. And you see the last two decades, Wisconsin has been the team with the most 1,800-yard rush seasons And Garrett Wolf in Northern Illinois, San Diego State, and Stanford. But Monte Ball, Melvin Gordon, Jonathan Taylor, Ron Dane, all coming through here, among others. And he is on the verge of 2,000 as Deal comes in for him that time to gain a seven for Taiwan Deal. You know, and we've hit on it, the effect of Wisconsin's run game in the second half, even more so in the fourth quarter. Big offensive line leans on the defenders, and sometimes it's hard to tackle the ball carrier in that second half. Hornybrook drops it off. 
And not going anywhere. Julian Huff in for Blake Cashman, who was out with a targeting penalty. Makes the stop, and no game. Question is, can they get there to use that run game late in the game with them down 13? Yeah, it's going to be tough. That's a great question, and that brings up Alex Hornibrook once again is needing to make plays in that pass game, and he needs wide receivers to get it done for him. Hornibrook steps up and nearly had it picked off again. He threw it right to Smith, the freshman defensive back. Now the fans are getting restless here. And the fans should be. That was once again a bad decision. Danny Davis, theoretically, is the place to go to. It's man-to-man -to -man coverage, high safety, work the middle of the field, but that doesn't mean the guy's open. He never got out of his break. Exactly. It was great coverage by Minnesota. And it once again looked like Alex Hornerbrook had made up his decision. I'm going to this guy come hell or high water, and Danny Davis was not open. So Groshek, the third down back, is in, third and ten. Orny Brook outside the pocket, says go downfield. Tip ball, sideline, intercepted. Julian Huff picked it off. And look who's at the bottom of the pile with his brother, but his twin, Jacob, 2 and 20. The twin brothers in the defensive side for Minnesota. And Alex Hornibrook is trying to make a play by extending it, getting up to the left side and just throws it back inside. The throw wasn't the problem in terms of making the decision to throw it in the first place. It was ball placement. You have to put it on the body of the receiver. That's probably the sixth or seventh time this evening that we've seen Hornibrook be off target especially on the high side and that was another look at it but Danny Davis was there potentially could have converted and the ball was just high now let's see if Minnesota can run some clock here and have a successful drive again up 13 trying to win this game for the first time since 03 corner blitz they'll screen against it Ottman Bell across midfield it's a gain of eight so look those twin brothers the Huffs they have said before that when they were younger, one of them would have a good game, the other one would not. It was almost impossible for them to have a good day at the same time, but in their last game, on the defensive side, they both get to play with a targeting penalty against Cashman, and maybe, just maybe, the defense will salt away Paul Bunyan's ax for the Gophers. Ibrahim. It's been very difficult for Wisconsin to tackle him the first time they touch him. Ibrahim is a, an efficient runner. And what I mean by that, so many times it's a muddy look in a, in a run attempt. It's not blocked perfectly. You have hands and arms and hats sticking in there, and it's up for the running back to create your own shot sometimes. And that's where the efficiency comes from. Do I get positive yards even though it's a – muddied look and Ibrahim does so often like we saw in that play. Ibrahim inviting the contact and he spins off. That was Wild Goose who took the first lick from the running back. And that's that's where you see it once again and what's happening is Ibrahim is bouncing outside. You can see the edge. The line's being caved down because Wisconsin's defending tackle to tackle, but it's the vision for Ibrahim to get back outside and find a little bit of running room. Minnesota takes the play clock down under 10. Again, up the middle. Van Ginkle to stop. The question is, who will play quarterback on the next series? For Wisconsin Jack Cohn is warming up over on the Badger sideline and remember what we talked about Olivia mentioned it at the top that Cohn has played in four games theoretically he can still redshirt but not if he takes one snap in this game so we were told that that isn't really what Wisconsin is thinking offensively if it's about winning the game all hands on deck including 
their sophomore, true sophomore, Jack Cohn. Green in to play Wildcat. Wisconsin loads the box. Paulson in motion. Green runs, and he ducks through that line for a first down Minnesota. Jason, we've seen that play more than once. Paulson comes in motion, adds a big body to the box, and it's really just a, a violent, powerful lead play by Seth Green. We saw it on a fourth down, and then they will do that, and they will bounce it outside by giving it to Ibrahim. When Ibrahim got the touchdown in that first half, it was off the exact same look. You run a zone play, and Ibrahim bounced it outside and scored the touchdown. All the same presentation offensively, two separate plays. Morgan back in on a first down. Ibrahim inside the 30 to the 26. It takes Edwards, the senior linebacker. So these 16 Wisconsin seniors, so successful, 41 and 11, the last thing you want is to go out losing this game at home. Yeah, you do not want that to be part of your legacy. And that group of seniors have won a lot of games, specifically 41 of them with their head coach, Paul Chris, coming at the same time. And you don't want to be that program that lets the ax go back to Minnesota. Ibrahim stretching out inside the 25. So it's going to be a third down and a short for Minnesota. Under two to go in this third quarter. 22 of the last 26 plays, running plays for the Gophers. Tanner Morgan's just seven for 13 in this game. Yeah, I mean, it's not about the pass game, and that's not who P.J. Fleck is. He wasn't that at Western Michigan, and he isn't that here at Minnesota. It's about a physical run game, and then everything else is set up by that. P.J. Fleck's final game at Western Michigan against these Badgers. Morgan, sideline, Johnson, he mistimed his jump. And it's batted away by Wild Goose, fourth down. That play call would have told me that potentially Minnesota would go for it on fourth down, and we see the field goal unit coming on. But third and three, we just talked about how the offensive line of scrimmage for Minnesota has controlled this matchup against the defensive line for Wisconsin. Third and three, I like my chances of putting Seth Green back in there in that Wildcat and getting physical. It's worked three times already in short yardage situations tonight. Carpenter from 42 for a 16-point game. It is good. So Caglianoni had an early miss for Wisconsin. Carpenter has been very good for Minnesota. Well, P.J. Fleck certainly knows this it was going to take a complete game and that's who pj fleck is that's who they were at western michigan this coaching staff the majority of them they win kind of holistically all phases of the game and special teams have been buttoned up on minnesota's side they coming up next saturday on abc big 12 title game texas and oklahoma red river redo then the American Championship, such sad news about Mackenzie Milton, the quarterback for UCF, and an ugly look at injury. Yeah. And you hope for his sake that he's going to be as okay as possible. And then Clemson and Pitt in the ACC title game. Clemson hoping to still be undefeated. They'll play South Carolina in a little while. Carpenter to the end zone for a touchback. And Jason, the last time we saw Mackenzie Milton, we were in there for a game earlier, gave him a hug and say, above all else, stay healthy. And yeah. that couldn't happen. And that certainly is hard to see. UCF still unbeaten. Hasn't lost in a couple years. However, it looks like the route to the college football playoff has closed for the Knights, especially without their quarterback. And notably, Alex Hornibrook remains in at quarterback for Wisconsin, even with Cohn getting loose on the sideline. 16-point game, still a two-score game. And Taylor bottled up by Julian Huff. So his brother Jacob leads the team in tackles. 
Julian has the interception and his fourth tackle right there. What a day for those twin brothers. That was Taylor's 18th carry for a buck 13. Incomplete. Davis the target. Third down coming up, and you talk about a short-circuited pass game. Yeah, it, it's not about just the quarterback. The pass game is protection and quarterback throwing the ball accurately and decision-making by the quarterback, and we've seen Hornerbrook throw into coverage a couple of times, and then he's getting zero to no help out of his wide receivers, and we've seen Danny Davis drop a couple of them, and as well as A.J. Taylor, just doesn't work in the pass game currently for Wisconsin. Remember what he told us earlier this year when we had their first game? He said, I want to be better outside the pocket, and we've just not seen that so far in this game. Groshik is well short. It's fourth down, Wisconsin. You can't veritably go for it here. No, can you, you can't. Not I don't even think Paul Chris would think about it. You have another quarter, and this game's not out of reach by any stretch of the imagination in terms of logistically, but it might be out of reach because of the way the offense, and particularly the pass game for Wisconsin, is playing currently. Long pass is just 13 years. Don't kid with COVID. M Health Fairview wants you to know that what you do today will affect your family and our community tomorrow. Good hand washing protects you and can slow the spread of the virus. Use soap and warm water. Be sure to wash both sides between your fingers, fingernails, thumbs, and wrists. Scrub for at least 20 seconds. Wash early and often. Wash your hands, avoid big groups. Stay home, don't go out. We've all got to do our part. Welcome back to ESPN College Football presented by Exxon Mobil as part of the Jiffy Lube Rivalry Series. Jump around happens in Badgerland even when the Badgers are trailing, as they are right now, 23 to seven, and punt time for Wisconsin's offense. This punt is a sidewinder out of bounds off the foot of Connor Allen. Time now for our Pacific Life game summary, and it's been the special teams and defense for the most part for the Gophers getting them there. Yeah, the defense has played well in terms of not allowing Jonathan Taylor to hurt them and forcing the, the ball into LA. Hornerbrook's hands in a sense, but it's special teams and to win games like this the Minnesota hasn't exactly been successful in Recently they have to play well in all phases of the game and right now Minnesota by and large has done exactly that Even running 13 fewer plays than Wisconsin in this game so far that may change if Minnesota can churn this out on the ground as we expect them to. Ibrahim into the pile, dragged back. Chris Cotter's in the studio, Chris. Gentlemen, Alabama Auburn, the Iron Bowl. This was a three-point game at the half. It is no longer. Two has been sensational. Touchdown on the ground and three through the air, including this one to Josh Jacobs. 31-14 right now, Ty. Roll it. They've been rolling all. Yeah. Citadel 10 to 10 last week, uh -huh. right? And it was a different story in the second half. That's all college football needed to find out is that when Alabama needs to be, they can also be an explosive second half team. They've done everything. They've answered every question and they've done it multiple times. We'll see tonight whether or not Notre Dame can stay in the ranks of the unbeatens along with them. And look at the battering ram that Ibrahim has become. Ibrahim is a really physical runner, and I've been very impressed with him. He's somewhat slight at 205. That's not a huge running back. When you think of Jonathan Taylor, the volume ball carrier is more like probably a 225 or 30 pound back. You remember Marion Barber when he was running there? It looked like trying to tackle a car wash yeah. all at once. And Ibrahim runs kind of like that, very hard to tackle. Five on the play clock. Morgan throws for it. Right at the stick and a first down to Rashad Bateman, the freshman out of Tiff County High School in Georgia. Georgia came for him hard. Tennessee visited. He stayed at Minnesota. Rashad Bateman did not have the first down initially. It's that second little second extra 
second effort move that converts and allows Minnesota to possess it. Tanner Morgan hasn't had to do a ton in the pass game. Managed the run game at the line of scrimmage, some decision making in the run pass option game. But Tanner Morgan, when he's had to, has come through by and large tonight. If you do this right, this drive can take you down in like the eight or seven minute mark, depending on the result of the drive. But you can Wisconsin the Badgers here. You can do what they like to do to you. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And the Badgers like to possess it in a physical downhill run game. But oh, by the way, that's who Minnesota wants to be. I think the absence of Olive Songapolu is front and center right now. Minnesota wants to run it. Plays basically even. It just seems like Jonathan Taylor, even though his yards are up there, his effect on the game has been muted to some extent. And then the pass game for Wisconsin just has not been there tonight. Ibrahim driving the pile all the way to the 46, 45 and a half. And so it's going to be third down and very short. Over 100 yards now for Ibrahim. You would think this would be another place for Seth Green in the third and short situation. The Swiss Army Knife may actually be the Wildcat quarterback as we speak, number 17. Paulson will be out to the left. Typically, the tight end comes in motion. The question is if it's going to be a lead or whether Ibrahim is going to get it around the left side once again from this formation. They whittle the play clock down once again. There's Paulson in motion. And they do run it straight ahead. Green for a first down. It's a pretty simple little concept. A nice little package that's been ultra productive for Minnesota in situations. Short yardage in particular. Converted a couple fourth downs. Paulson comes in motion, becomes the extra blocker in the box, kicks out the end, and then it's Seth. Green at 240 that just runs up between the tackle box and converts. Grinding the clock, Jason, as you talked about. And credit the coaching staff and the freshman quarterback, Morgan, for watching the play clock all the way down, essentially to zero with every snap. Ibrahim sidestepping for a yard. This Minnesota roster is more than half Freshman, 51.7% freshman for DJ Fleck. If they win, they go to a bowl game and they get a couple weeks worth of extra yeah. practice, which could be hugely important with a pretty soft schedule off the top next year for that this team. That is such a good point. It's, it's essentially bowl practice is like getting another set of spring practices. When players are growing and maturing as redshirt freshmen or true freshmen, that it cannot be overstated, the value in that in building a program. We asked the offensive coordinator, Kirk Soraka, this week, how important would these bowl practices be? And before he answered, he kind of took a breath, thought about it, and just set off. Be huge. I mean, you could tell the visceral reaction to what that would mean to his offense was substantial. Yeah, no, no question about it. Is Minnesota finds themselves in a third and six. Typically, it's a mixed down, meaning you can throw it or, or run the football. But keep an eye on Tanner Morgan here. He hasn't kept the football in a true quarterback run for a while. Redshirt freshman out of the state of Kentucky. Morgan to throw down the middle for Johnson and a first down Minnesota that was a dagger and that's been the difference most of this game is when Minnesota has needed one this is a run pass option it's the zone run inside and then the quarterback Tanner Morgan pulls it after the second level defenders for Wisconsin are invited up to tackle Ibrahim the physical run game inside leads to a really good slant hookup with Taylor Johnson over the middle of the football behind that second level. Johnson, who they say is a second coach on that sideline, he tries to coach up people from receiver to other positions. And what a win it would be in his junior year going through everything Minnesota has gone through. You have a team before P.J. 
going to protest a bowl game. Yeah. You have all the departures leading to 52% of the players being freshmen. And for the guys who have been through the ringer here, this would be quite the release and maybe the signature win of their time at Minnesota. Still eight minutes and change to go, but the light at the end of the tunnel is certainly flickering for Wisconsin. Ibrahim to the 16-yard line, Olivia. Okay, Fleck told me before the game that they are playing eight freshmen on offense tonight. That's the most all season, but all things considered, he said, we're exactly where we want to be in year two. But it has been interesting for me looking at the sideline. You know, who are the leaders with all these underclassmen? And it's kind of taken on an identity of its own where everyone is one. There doesn't seem to be a hierarchy like you see on most sidelines. And it's games like this that identify leaders quite a bit. This is rivalry games are part of your legacy, but it also establishes leadership for years going forward. Olivia, when you talk about so many young players, our leaders are being identified as we speak. And you think about it for the fan base, there have been stories written this week about attendance declining at the home games recently. But you win a series that you haven't won since we used to put fax machine numbers on our business cards. Uh, What's it's going to go machine? a long way. Exactly. Okay. It's going to go a long way. Yeah, no question. And as Minnesota tries to close out this drive and the clock continues to run, again, keep an eye on Tanner Morgan. He hasn't kept the ball for quite some time in that zone read. It hasn't been a read lately. It's been a kind of a give type of situation. But if Tanner Morgan keeps the football, Wisconsin has not checked him recently. He gives it away, and this will set up third down. Chris Cotter, time to relax for the Wisconsin defense. 8-24 on this drive for Minnesota. Longest drive of the year for the Gophers in a huge rivalry game for Paul Bunyan's tax. Third down, Minnesota. Morgan keeps it and gets cracked. T.J. Edwards stood him up, and now you take the field goal and you make it a three-score game, right? Without a doubt, and that was a great job by T.J. Edwards because that was the play I was talking about. Tanner Morgan hadn't kept it on the true zone read for quite some time, and T.J. Edwards really gap exchanged with the defensive end, scraped over the top and made, top and made a great tackle on Tanner Morgan. Emmett Carpenter, three for three, 34 yards, 23 yards, 42 yards. What you're probably going to see here is TJ or PJ Fleck calling a timeout with about one second left on the play clock. And there it is. 541 to go. Minnesota trying to make it a three score game after this. Don't kid with COVID. M Health Fairview wants you to know that what you do today will affect your family and our community tomorrow. Social distancing helps you avoid contact with those who may be infected with the virus. What can you do? Steer clear of crowds of 10 or more people. Keep a distance of six feet between you and others in public spaces. And if possible, work from home. Wash your hands, avoid big groups. Stay home, don't go out. We've all got to do our part. Since 2011, Wisconsin's beaten Minnesota by a combined 227 and 95. And the axe is so precious that when Olivia Decker asked if she could use the axe for a report, the answer was no, even though she married into the Badger family. Yeah, if that doesn't get it done for us, then we don't have any shot at getting that thing out of the bag early. Doesn't Sam have any pull around here? It seems like Sam could have called somebody to get that <laughs> done, but it's not exactly a basketball trophy so maybe that's was the deciding factor he could have at least called to axe carpenter to go four for four and it is no good wow there were two things that could keep hope alive for wisconsin it was the blocked field goal or a missed field goal is this enough to keep the axe in Madison? We'll find out soon. Final season for Mike LeCrone, the band director here in Madison. 
50 years. He's the longest tenured member of the Wisconsin Athletic Department. He said before the game he, he couldn't even imagine what it'll be like to step aside. He saw the jersey that he got, and he is beloved by so many that have come through, and he likely remembers their names as well. He is a special guy creating a special tradition, and somebody else is going to have to be on that ladder for the next Badger home game next year at Camp Randall Stadium. But congratulations to Mike LeCrone and the Badgers trying to get him a comeback here. So Taylor comes out. Clock moving. Horny Brook. Couldn't get away. Ball came loose. Who's got it? Minnesota football. Gary Moore knocked it free, and look who it is. It's Marion Barber's little bro. Last time the Gophers won in this series, his older brother ran for over a buck 30, and now Thomas Barber controls this turnover. And to me, this game has been much, much more about Minnesota making plays as opposed to Wisconsin not making a whole lot of plays, particularly in the pass game offensively, but that was shoddy pocket presence by Alex Hornibrook. Just loose with the football and short time where you need two scores and two two-point conversions anyway. That ball has to be one-two in progression and thrown away if you don't have anything. And the third-year starter, Hornibrook, just did not look good on that particular play. Williams in as the tailback. Williams breaks a tackle. Away he goes. Touchdown, Gophers. This time, a barber led to a rushing touchdown for Minnesota. Well, cue the axe for Minnesota. It's going back to Minneapolis, and I'm not exactly sure how this works. We can look down and still see the, the axe is still in its case, and Wisconsin certainly don't, doesn't know what it looks like to give it up. None of these players do. The tradition for Wisconsin has become that only the seniors get to touch the axe, but Minnesota is going to ambush the sideline after this recovery from Barber. One win, play for Williams. Win, 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 win. And Goldie's got a big old smile on his face. Win, 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 win. Night football tonight, 8 Eastern on ABC. Coming up shortly here, Badgers and Gophers living in harmony, but one is bragging inside, and it's the gentleman in the yellow. 30 to 7 is your score. The Gophers over the Badgers trying to win this series for the first time in a decade and a half. Nothing going right for Wisconsin. November 8, 2003. You may remember it if you're a Gopher fan. Jim Sorgi to Owen Daniels for a touchdown. It's an 18 point first half deficit. They came back though to tie it. But Reese Lloyd not only sticks the kick, but then just absolutely bum rushes the sideline to get the ax. Wisconsin from November of 2016 decided to troll the Gophers because Twitter didn't exist the last time that happened. Looks like this will be the year for that to change. And congratulations to Reese Lloyd, whose phone will no longer ring on the day of Minnesota and Wisconsin to ask what it was like last time a win happened for his Gophers. Horny Brook to the sideline and way incomplete. Keandre Thomas already celebrating in the defensive backfield for Minnesota. And you talk about importance here. Minnesota's going to go to a bowl game with a win, and Horny yeah. Brook, who's back from that concussion, has not played well. No, he, he really hasn't. And he's been off target. His decision decision making has been shoddy. And when he didn't place the football properly, he just didn't have a, have a lot of help at the wide receiver position in particular. That's a long throw, and it looked like it was intercepted. Let's see who comes up with the ball. It is Gopher football. 
picked off by Chris Williamson. Another turnover for a rabid bunch of Gophers. This is a really nice break by Chris Williamson, but this ball, as you talked about, it's late to the outside, and the ball was left slightly inside. Those are all things that lead to balls outside being intercept, intercepted, and that really was quintessential Alex Hornibrook's night, just being a little bit off, and in a handful of instances, it has cost his team like it did right there. He'll have a bowl game to recalibrate as he did last year with such a strong bowl game. Williams on the run. This big as well for Minnesota as they look like they're going to hand one more game to Blake Cashman, their senior linebacker who went out in the first half with a targeting penalty. Had Minnesota lost, he would not have had any more college football to play. Blake Cashman actually might be ready to storm the field looking closely keep an eye if number 36 shows his face again and he might be the first one to the axe by rule you only have to remain in the locker room for the duration of the game that's what I'm thinking. Under supervision, and then you burst through the door. <laughs> no question. To go get the hacks. I think 36, Cashman is going to reappear. I certainly would if I was him. Timeout Minnesota. For what reason, that's yet to be determined. To savor this and let it soak into that youngest roster in the game of football currently at the college level. But Minnesota has actually is actually on the verge of winning this game exactly the way Wisconsin usually wins games. Control the clock, run the football in a physical way, good decision making at the quarterback position, win special teams, and be sound defensively. Those are all things that usually describe Wisconsin, and tonight it was Minnesota. That earlier drive, we were talking about this with our statistician, Ed Spita. That earlier drive in the second half was the longest drive in the Big Ten this year. Yeah, time-wise, 9 minutes and 16 seconds, 15 plays. You talk about a dagger. A young team that's learning how to win in a rivalry game right in front of us. That's how you do it. 15 plays over 9 minutes when you needed to make something good happen, and that's what it looks like. Also talk about 17 points and counting, really, off of turnover. Yep. That's also usually what Wisconsin does. For a defense that gave up 646 against Illinois in the yardage column just a couple of weeks ago, nice recovery for Minnesota to lead to what looks like is going to be the first win in Madison for the Gophers since 1994. Daryl Bevel to Ron Johnson to give the Badgers a 14-10 lead. But 2-2 Adwell, the elder, his son now playing at Louisville. And Goldie was a little, a little different. Goldie a little happier nowadays. Nowadays. Over to the Minnesota sideline. Goldie looking a little ragged back in 94. <laughs> a little weather beat. He's been reborn. Put on a little weight. Maybe got a... Maybe that was his winter coat back in the day. He's doing the keto know. diet like you are. That's right. 346 to go here. Fourth down Minnesota. They're going to go for it. Green, the quarterback in that Wildcat formation again. And he'll run a lead play for himself. And it looks like he's short. Although the second look at the spot from the far side official seems like he's there. So we're going to check the spot here. That yeah, looks like a first down. They may have just gotten that half yard back they didn't get on the earlier spot. I knew you were going to go there. We're at least going to have a have the chain gang come out. But that concept right there has worked wonders for Minnesota in short down short yardage situations. Seth Green. I actually think he comes down short on this one, but 
maybe if you put them together, he ends up converting on this one. It is a first down, Minnesota. I thought he was short by a football on this one, and I thought he had it by a football earlier in the game, but here we are. But Seth Green in that Wildcat, or whatever we want to call it, has been very productive. The tight end, Ferguson comes, or Paulson comes in motion, adds a hat to the box, and then it's really just a, a zone read situation, and there's that Happy mascot again. Hey, Goldie is thrilled right now. It's like he's got a painted on smile. He's never Goldie, going away. Goldie has put on some weight since that 94 thing we saw. Williams on the run. And second down coming up. Look, uh, the axe is one of the great trophies. Paul Bunyan's axe, one of the great trophies in college football. We decided that we were going to survey our crew on what the best rivalry trophy is. So these are the eight that we ended up with. Paul Bunyan's axe, the Fremont Cannon, couple of boots that you really care about because you played for the bronze boot. The troll, which you became when we discussed <laughs> the possibility of the bronze boot losing. I held that bronze boot in my hands twice post game. I was not going to let that lose in the first round. Williams again. He wants more. And he's got it for six. <laughs> Who knew Ibrahim and Williams would be Barber and Maroney? One of the several dozen, it seems like, freshmen, true freshmen on this team is Bryce Williams. 14 bowl practices are their gift after this one, plus about a six and a half, half foot ax to take back to Minneapolis. A lot of trees to fell. Here's the semifinal of our rivalry trophy playoff. The bronze boot did make it through against the troll. Floyd of Rosedale against the ax. And the question is who would end up with the final, the final matchup from our crew vote. In our rivalry trophy playoff semifinals. I think there was some um, political pressure being applied to who got in the finals. I'm just saying. <laughs> it was not rigged in any way. There was no way. No, I'm not even going to go there. I'd give it away. BJ Fleck and his defense 24 points off uh, four turnovers from Alex Hornibrook. Again, this is a defense that was beleaguered enough that he fired his defensive coordinator. Joe Rossi, the interim defensive coordinator and defensive line coach, after they gave up 646 yards to Illinois November 3rd, it looked like it was going to be a lost season. Yeah. A bowl was definitely something of a pipe dream, and they have turned it into what looks like it's going to be a 6-6 six and six record. You see the change November 4th, immediately after that Illinois game. And a significant difference as Wisconsin will have it from the 25. Let's award the uh, the rivalry trophy championship because the, the boot didn't make it. Is it Paul Bunyan's axe or the troll? I have no idea what the troll is. What it's, in the world? It's Concordia Moorhead against St. Olaf, Rosen Island's favorite school. You got basically almost an all Minnesota final. I choose the axe. You? Yeah, I think I might go with the axe too because our producer uh, Brian Boyle kind of make me. You would have voted for the troll if no, he wasn't actually, pressuring you. I think the troll was coughed up by some wild animal somewhere. <laughs> that looks like a fur ball. Send your cards and letters to Kelly Stauffer if you're with Concordia Moorhead or St. Olaf. Groshek a run to the 45-yard line. Huff with the tackle. But how about Minnesota? I mean, you don't win in this game for 15 years. It's pretty easy to say, oh, here we go again. And that never even came into play because Wisconsin wasn't really in this game after the middle of the third quarter. Consider a, an important part of in the second half. Wisconsin got the ball to start the second half. And on fourth and four, they threw an outside fade route that was 
badly thrown by their quarterback because the message was we need to get something on this drive. The ensuing possession by Minnesota, same situation, fourth and four, they lined up and kicked a field goal because it was the same mental game. We need something on the board. The teams needed something differently. Wisconsin did not get theirs in that drive, and Minnesota did, and Minnesota hasn't looked back since. Did you follow me there? I absolutely did. All right. Fourth down didn't go well. Minnesota won. Is that the Cliffs notes? Danny Davis, the catch. Smith ushers him out of bounds, and here comes the axe. Sad to say for the Badger folks, we will follow it in its tour of Camp Randall Stadium. You want to take it off your sideline so they don't conquer your sideline that in an imperialistic yeah. Big Ten sort of way. Where do you go with it? Do you actually escort it clear to the Minnesota sideline or do you set it kind of gently, subtly behind the goalpost or something? Or Wisconsin just, isn't used to this. You could just walk away with it too and make them chase you down I'm through the streets sure of Madison. I'm you don't want that. Minnesota would find you. It's been a long while since they had that Paul Bunyan's axe in their hands. The axe march around Camp Randall that has not been seen in a decade and a half. You saw the footage from 2003. Reese Lloyd basically put his foot on the gas pedal and went sprinting away. They're going to put it by the goalpost, which... That's a good idea. Why? You want to steer clear of what's about to happen off of Minnesota's sideline if you have anything to do with Wisconsin. Davis falling down, reels in a touchdown with just over a minute to go. And that's a good example of the plays that Wisconsin did not make for the, the rest of this game. It's a back shoulder throw, well thrown by Alex Hornibrook, and a difficult catch made by Danny Davis. Too little, too late. There were opportunities earlier in this game, and Danny Davis himself dropped a few, and certainly Alex Hornerbrook was off target multiple times. They're going to go for two here. Would have to be a series of onside kicks and unfortunate gopher events to get Wisconsin back in this game. Hornybrook has a wide open man in the end zone for two. That was very easy for Adam Brumholtz. And there is the pole axe. That's a lot of Wisconsin wow. wins all the way down the handle. You'd have to really choke up to get to a Minnesota victory there. And Paul Christ, who scored one of his two touchdowns as a Badger against Minnesota, is going to watch as his team sinks to 500 against Minnesota once again. 60, 60, and 8. And last year was the first time that Wisconsin has ever held a lead in this series. Isn't that amazing? I find that amazing. Yeah, I mean, what we know is Wisconsin dominating this series. And... So all the, all the new building of facilities on campus in Minneapolis, they may make a special place for this one, hoping they keep it for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Onside kick coming. At 37 and 15. And they will do a little trickery and pop it this direction. A flag has come in. A flag on the play. Gophers have it with Rashad Bateman. I mean, you think about this. Owen Daniels, Marion Barber, Lawrence Maroney, they finished their NFL careers. That All those guys played the Upside. last time. Kicking team number 54. Five-yard penalty from the end of the kick. First down. And if you're P.J. Fleck, you're five and six, you know you're going to get a bowl win, uh, a bowl chance with this win here. But he's been freaking out on the sideline, and rightfully so. 
I mean, that's P.J. Fleck in a, in a nutshell. He feels elite every day. We asked as, him on the phone, how'd you feel? And he said, elite. And he was right this week. And the thing about rowing the boat is before long, you have to have some fruit from rowing that boat. And this is what some of the fruit looks like winning this game. It is a cold day in Madison. PJ may be frozen stiff before he gets off the field. Some Gopher fans thought it was going to be longer than a cold day in Madison until they got a win in this series. And finally, in the Arctic air of November 2018, there are new axe handlers on the move. Minnesota claims Paul Bunyan's axe for the first time in 15 years. Thank you. 